All right, so it is time to talk about Newton's third law of motion, and here's how it goes. Newton's third law of motion states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It's probably the one that you guys know the best, and here it is for you to write down. And I want to talk about this one because this one seems to be the, the least intuitive, the one that doesn't always sit in your stomach very well because it just doesn't always make sense, even though it's, it is in fact true. Uh, so let's start with just a, a simple example to talk about this. All right, we have a spring, and it's uncompressed, so the spring's not really pushing up. And I'm gonna drop a set of books on the spring, and you can probably guess what's gonna happen. As I set the books on the spring, it's gonna compress the spring. So now the, the downward force of the books acting on the spring, according to Newton's third law, will have a, there'll be a reaction, that's the action. The reaction will be the spring pushing back up on the books. So we have an action-reaction pair here. The action of the books pushing down, the reaction of the spring pushing back up. Now, the same thing is gonna apply even when I set these books on a table. Even though the table doesn't seem like it compresses, the wood actually will compress slightly. You won't notice it. So as the, table, uh, the, the books have the action of pushing down on the table, it'll compress the table slightly, and the table will wanna uncompress causing it to push back up equally on the books. All right, so we, we stumbled on a really important piece here, all right? So I have a ball, and this ball is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply a force on the ball, that's my action. My action is to be pushing the ball in this direction. The reaction is gonna be the ball pushing back on me. The action and the reaction come in pairs. For every action, there's a reaction that pairs up with it, all right? That's the first important piece. The second important piece here is that my action on the ball is different than the ball's reaction, which is on me. We don't act on the same thing. I act on the ball, the ball acts on me. All action-reaction pairs act on different objects. All right, now that we have that idea down, I want to take a look at um, an example of an action-reaction pair. And here's, this is in your notes, a baseball player hits a ball without a, with a bat. Describe the action-reaction pair of uh, forces in this situation. So let's take a look at this. I'll get my pen to do some writing with. Uh, there we go. So here, remember, the action and reaction act on different objects. And if we want to say that the action force and you know it really doesn't matter which one's the action and reaction but let's say the action force at going this way on the ball well the reaction is the ball going this way on the bat so the bat is acting on the ball but the ball is acting on something different it's acting on the bat okay they're both acting on different objects so there's your action reaction pair now here's some guidelines to help you pick out action reaction pairs and you can write these down we'll go through them one at a time so don't feel like you have to rush but here's the first one both are always there whenever any force appears. There's always an action and reaction. All right, for example, your foot is pushing down on the ground as you walk. The ground is pushing back up. They always have the exact same strength. Okay, these, they're going to be balanced in this sense. So if you're pushing down with 150 pounds of your weight, right, remembering that uh, weight is, is a, a force, then the, the ground's going to push back up with 150 pounds. They're always in opposite directions. All right? So they'll always be working opposite. Uh, action and reaction are opposite from each other. They always act on different objects. This is a really important one to really understand. So in this example, your foot is acting on the ground, but the ground is acting on you. So you act on one object, the other object acts on you. And so they're both real forces and they can cause change in motion. And we're going to talk about this in more detail in a second, but for example, to move forward on your skateboard. You are still balancing, you, you still have an opposite and equal reactions between your foot and the ground as you push yourself along and movement occurs while this is happening. So let's look at a, a classic example here. I want to talk about it before I go on to the next slide and kind of go through a thought process on this. And the example goes like this. This is a kind of a classic physics problem. You, uh, you have a donkey, right? Pretend you have a donkey for a moment. And your donkey pulls a cart. And 
the uh, the donkey, having maybe sat in on one or two uh, science classes, says, you know, Newton's third law says for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. So I'm not going to pull this cart anymore because no matter how hard I pull this cart, the cart's going to pull back on me with the same amount of, of force and will never be able to go anywhere. Now your job for a moment here is to think about how uh, this argument is wrong. We obviously know that a donkey will move the cart, but how can you describe it to the donkey? How can you convince the donkey that his argument is wrong and, and justify your own answer? So let's think about this for a second. Okay, uh, it's time to think about this. Got to think about this. Got to solve this problem. Okay, think worthing, think worthing, think worthing. Um, so donkey pulls the car. Uh, okay, how? This doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously, a donkey's going to pull the car. I can't. It can't outsmart me. I can't be outsmarted by a jackass. This would be bad. This would be very bad. All right. So let's think about what we talked about. Um, oh, that. These, these forces act in opposite directions and they act, on, they, act, they act on different objects. Yes, that's the key. They act on different objects. So the donkey is pushing on the ground and the car is pushing on the donkey. All right, so let's look at this problem. Let's figure this out. And let's start by saying uh, two things. We have, we have more than one action-reaction pair going on here. The, the one that the donkey is getting caught up on is the action-reaction pair that's happening between um, him and he's pulling he, his action is acting against the cart right so he's pulling this way against the cart and the cart is pulling an equal opposite reaction I'm trying to hit my head here All right against the horse that is that is equal and opposite the, the horse is pulling the cart the cart is pulling the horse back Okay, and and also pulling me along with it, but there's something else going on here too, and it's a totally different action-reaction pair, and so and we'll do it in a different color here. It's the frictional force. Okay, so the horse is also pushing against the ground with a lot of force. The horse is pretty strong; it makes this arrow even longer, and the ground with all the, the the friction is basically doing the same thing in the opposite direction, right? Equal and opposite. But you'll notice my, my action pairs here are different than the action pairs up here. So we're going to have a net movement of the horse in the direction that we want the horse to move, right? The horse is now going to be moving this way. Because even though each action-reaction pair is opposite and equal, it doesn't mean that these ones can't be larger than these ones and that the horse cannot, in fact, pull the cart and myself. With my cat ears. So I, I often find it easier to explain this through momentum. And it's something I want to talk about now. And you can see some momentum in action here. But before we get into the actual momentum, let's, let's talk about um, the formula momentum. Uh, we use this for a formula, P equals MV. The P stands for momentum. I know that seems weird. Why would we use the letter P for momentum? Well, the letter M is already used for mass, right? That's one good reason. And we know that V is velocity. There we go. So P equals M times V. Now, we could do this as, remember the old uh, the wheel here. And we could do this wheel again, just like the F equals MA, this would be the same setup, P equals MV. So you could solve for velocity, it's P over M, or solve for mass, which is momentum over velocity, you can do that. Uh, typically, mass is going to be in units of kilograms, and velocity is in units of meters per second. So our unit for momentum, there is no nice tidy unit here, it is going to be kilograms times meters per second for a unit. So this, this formula is going to help us also explain Newton's third law in more detail. But before we go there, I want to make sure that you really understand what momentum means. And the first thing is that this elephant does not have momentum. All right? No momentum. 
Why? Because it has, for velocity, zero meters per second. It's not moving. It's standing in the middle of the road, blocking the road. Um, this person right here is getting mad and wants to yell at it. But it has no momentum. Do not confuse inertia, which this elephant has a lot of. Do not confuse inertia with momentum. In order to have momentum, you need mass. Yes, elephant has that. But you also need to be moving a velocity. All right? So uh, here's a good example. Again, these two people. Remember Newton's third law. Let's not forget Newton's third law. It says that they're going to push on each other, and it's going to be equal and opposite. Sorry about that. Three equal and opposite reaction. That's true. But will they both go sliding away at equal velocities? Not necessarily, because by equal and opposite, I could say that the momentum on this side is going to be equal to the momentum on this side. All right? But this girl's mass is much lower than this girl's mass over here. So therefore, this girl's velocity is going to be much faster when they push off each other. And this girl's velocity is going to be much lower. All right? This is, and we can go through a formula and figure this out. I want to do this with a few other examples. And I have some examples for you to solve on your paper, on your uh, notes. But uh, let's look at this in terms of recoil. All right, recoil. Let me write recoil. It's just the idea that when the cannonball shoots out and it speeds off in this direction really, really fast, this much larger object, the cannon itself, will go backwards. That's called recoil. Now, we know that the, the cannonball weighs a lot less than the cannon. Since its mass is very small, its velocity will be huge. And since the cannon's mass is very huge, its recoil kicking back will be very small. So that the momentum is equal on both sides. I had to put this picture in. This is bad, bad news, right? This gun is definitely going to recoil, and hopefully she didn't shoot this because she'd have herself a really good black eye at the very least. But let's talk about recoil of guns, and I want to show you an example of that whole thing that for every action, the bullet racing out, the gun's going to kick back equally, but the gun is obviously not jabbing into your arm or your eyeball, it might here. But uh, it, it's, it's not going to act that way. All right, so I want to do an example here of what I was just talking about with recoil. So I'm going to make two columns. Whoops, I spell this right. Recoil here. That's the recoil of the gun and the bullet racing off in that direction. That was my sound effect, yes. Um, now, here's what I'm saying. That the momentum of the recoil in this direction is going to be equal and opposite to the momentum of the bullet in this direction. That's Newton's third law. But this does not mean that the gun is going to you know, pierce through your shoulder like the bullet would through whatever the target is. Why is that? Well, it's because the mass of the gun is much larger. Especially if we consider the mass of the gun as it is being a part of you because it's pushed up against your body, so it's like the mass of the gun and the mass of you. And I'm just going to use easy numbers here. And let's say the mass of the gun is um, 100 kilograms. That's the gun and you. And the mass of the bullet is like, and it's not one kilogram. I know that. But like I said, I'm just using easy numbers here so we could do quick mental math. One kilogram. Uh, the velocity of the bullet is going to be Enormous. It's gonna be like I'm um, just kind of making this up. It's gonna be like 500 meters per second. I have no idea how fast it would be in meters per second. Well, our momentum our, is gonna be p equals m times v, one times 500, 500 kilograms times meters per second. Well, remember I said equal and opposite. That means it must be 500 over here as well. So how fast does the gun recoil back? What is our recoil velocity? So it's 100 times x equals 500. We know, we could do this mental math. It's 5 meters per second. So you see, we can have equal and opposite action-reaction pairs. That doesn't mean that the velocity of the bullet is going to be equal and opposite to the recoil of the gun. 
you have a problem like this, and I want to take a look at that as well right here. All right, so you had a problem where it said uh, an astronaut throws a, a wrench into space, right? Let me get my writing utensil here. There we go. And I think I said that the wrench is traveling. I didn't, in my first example there, I didn't, for the bullet and the recoil, I didn't use velocity as being negative. Remember, one is going forward, the bullet's going forward, the recoil would be a negative, it's going backwards. But the, the wrench is going 10 meters per second. I say negative because it's, it's going in the opposite direction of the recoil of the astronaut, which was the question mark. That's our velocity. The mass of the wrench, I said, was, what, two kilograms, I believe? And the mass of the astronaut was 100 kilograms. So we can, we can calculate momentum. P equals M times V for the wrench. Momentum for wrench. So that would be uh, 2 times negative 10, which would be negative 20 kilograms times meters per second. Now remember over here, we said for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. The action of the astronaut throwing the wrench out and the reaction of the wrench pushing the astronaut backwards, that would be the recoil of it is the same. So that means we can also say, well, that means the momentum of the astronaut going backwards is equal to the momentum of the wrench going forwards. So if the momentum is 20 here, negative 20, it's going to be positive 20 here, just showing that it's going in two different directions. It's still 20 and 20. So we can say, okay, well, if P equals MV, and we know that momentum, the P, is 20, and that the mass is 100, what is the V? What's, what's our unknown variable? So we do our math that you learned in algebra. We say, okay, I'll just divide the 100 out so that we're solving just for momentum. And what's 20 over 100? We could re reduce that to um, what, one, one over five, right? One fifth, which is the same as 0.2. So the velocity of the recoil is much less than the velocity of the wrench being thrown. But the momentum is the same. All right, so I want to talk about now uh, how using this, it's called a Newton's Cradle, how momentum is conserved. It's called conservation of momentum. And most of these have, have um, five of these ball bearings on it. This one is, just has four right now. And we know that each one has an equal mass. And when I pick this up, and drop it, it's going to have velocity, and with mass and velocity, you have momentum. Right? So you've seen these before. Now, the idea that what works here is that the momentum of this ball is conserved. Uh, what I mean by that, the conservation piece is it's, it does not go away. It doesn't stay with this ball necessarily, but what it'll do is when it hits this ball, the momentum is transferred into this ball and then into this one, and then to this one, and since this one has nothing to hit, it goes upward. It's not perfect conservation because we have friction, but if we could do this in a frictionless environment, it'd be perfectly conserved. So you can see that happening again. So what happens if I double my mass, and I have roughly the same velocity, then I'm going to have more momentum. And what happens is I have two balls going off on the other side. What's going to happen if I triple my mass. Now we should know mathematically that momentum equals mass times velocity. If I have the same velocity and I triple my mass, what will happen? I want you to think about this and when we get to class, I will show you.